A frequent question that I am sometimes asked regarding the treatment of HPV and cervical dysplasia is, what is my opinion about the use of vaginal suppositories? There was a 2018 study, was a case study, published on the use of a green tea vaginal cream and a uh, curcumin vaginal suppository and its use in getting rid of HPV. So why don't we start with um, looking at this case study and then um, I'll give you my opinion about um, when and if to use and under what circumstances to use vaginal suppositories. This is the 2018 case study that used a, it was a 15% green tea extract uh, cream and then a curcumin suppository. This was, and it was done in a 48 year long. So this is a case study. This means it's just one person. So one person was treated uh, she was 48 years old. She was diagnosed with HPV on routine examination. So she had no cervical dysplasia. Um, don't know whether this is a recent HPV infection, but the fact that she didn't have dysplasia is suggestive that she wasn't really having a problem with the HPV, at least not at this point. The green tea cream and the curcumin suppository were applied on alternate days over a period of time, about three months. But apparently after only a month of treatment, the gynecologist did a repeat um, HPV test and found it negative for HPV. My thoughts. Remember, this is a case study, so it's, it's one person. Um, and the problem with this case study is it's a treatment of a condition that often goes away by itself. So we're all, you know, we all pretty much get exposed to HPV at some point. Most of us will clear it uh, without any sort of problem. So the challenge when doing a case study with something that often goes away by itself is it's difficult to attribute the success and the effect of treatment on something that often goes away by itself. Now, that being said, most treatment intervention type um, research starts with a case study. So I've done case studies myself. You start with a case study, see whether it looks like it's working, and then maybe you'll go on to a case series where you're doing a whole bunch of cases and compiling them all together. Had this been a case series, like say that it was uh, 100 women with HPV and you did the same treatment intervention and 100% of the women cleared HPV in about a month, I would be very impressed with that. That would be impressive. Um, we just don't know yet. So my opinion about suppositories, I've been treating cervical dysplasia and HPV since 1995. So for about 25 years, I've been treating it. So I have a lot of experience. I've treated hundreds and hundreds of cases. When I started treating cervical dysplasia in 1995, I used escharotic treatment. And escharotic treatment is hands down the best way to treat cervical dysplasia. Now at that point in time, I was always, pretty much always using vaginal suppositories as part of my treatment intervention. So I had women doing uh, usually a couple different suppositories weekly, well nightly, during the pretty much just about the entire course of escharotic intervention. I also use suppositories for some other things. So I used a company called Earth's Harvest. Earth's Harvest made these wonderful suppositories. They had maybe six different suppositories that were individually wrapped. They were beautiful suppositories. Um, but then maybe about 2014, somewhere around 2014 or 2015, they stopped making them. Now, I had already stopped using suppositories mostly for the treatment of cervical dysplasia because I don't think vaginal suppositories work, or at least they don't work very well for cervical dysplasia, especially moderate and severe dysplasia. So maybe around 2010, you know, I started doing more experimentation with how I treated cervical dysplasia in HPV. So I was modifying my escharotic solution and doing different things because my goal was to find the best way to treat HPV and dysplasia. Um, I wanted to do and still do want to do as little as possible to get the job done. So at that time I was trying different things and seeing what, you know, what worked the best and what didn't work. One of the things I did was I started phasing out suppositories to see what effect it would have on the outcome. And I really didn't see any change in outcome of, of all of my difficult cases, the SIN2 and SIN3 cases. I didn't notice any difference whether I was using suppositories or not. Um, 
I was really disappointed when Earth's Harvest stopped making the suppositories because they had a suppository that was really good for chronic vaginal infections. So there's some women that'll have, um, you know, flip-flop between a yeast infection and a bacterial infection, and this is like an ongoing problem. So a woman will have a yeast infection, she'll get an antifungal for it, and then develop a bacterial infection, and then use something like metronidazole, and then it'll clear it up, and then maybe she'll be okay for a month, or two months, or three months, and then the whole cycle starts all over again. Very frustrating, and kind of never goes away. So there was a suppository that Earth's Harvest made, an essential oil suppository that worked. It was like a miracle. And for some women, it was the only thing that afforded them any relief. So I was really more disappointed about the fact that it removed one of my treatment interventions for women that were having chronic um, issues. So again, that being said, I had already phased out um, for the most part using suppositories for cervical dysplasia. So where can you, you know, and when should you use vaginal suppositories? You can make vaginal suppositories. Um, you can buy a form even on Amazon that you pour in your, you know, the concoction that you make and you put it in the form and then you put it in the freezer and, and you have your own suppositories. Um, there's, you know, there's an upside to that and a downside. The upside is that um, you're doing it yourself. It doesn't generally cost very much and your treatment is under your control. The downside is that the treatment is under your control. This is the image of what should be a cervix of a woman that I was treating. Um, she was flying in from the East Coast once a month and she made her own suppositories um, unbeknownst to me and started using them between treatments. Usually when somebody's coming in from that far away, they'll come in maybe once a month and do like a double treatment over the course of a couple days. So this was, uh, this was after doing six treatments. So between the sixth and seventh treatment, she started making her own suppositories, using them vaginally. This should not be here. This is all just paste like, like wet sand that's packed against her cervix. So on the other side of this wall of, um, of her suppository is her cervix actually. It took me about 10 minutes or more to just clear all this stuff away. Now, fortunately, she, was, um, she wasn't completely self-treating. I mean, she was under my care, so I saw this on her subsequent visit and I was able to clear it away and make sure her cervix looked okay and then um, you know, advise her to you know, either stop using the suppository or at least change her formulation. Her cervix actually was looking pretty good pretty early on. So this is after doing four treatments and um, you know, her cervix was actually looking really good. There's probably only a little bit of dysplasia still just in this area right here. So it's, at that point, it looks like it's probably a really small amount. But despite that, she was wigging out about the HPV part of it, and um, which a lot of people do. I mean, it's understandable because there's, for some people, there's an amount of shame or, you know, feeling like it's an STD and, and really, really wanting to get rid of HPV whether they have dysplasia or not. So she fell into that category where she was wanting to do everything and anything possible to try to get rid of the HPV. So her result was using this suppository, which just isn't a good, you know, it wasn't a good formulation. Now, fortunately, like I said, when I cleared this all away, her cervix, um, it was a little irritated, but it didn't seem, um, you know, didn't seem that it was damaged or any problem from it. I'd have to say I don't think that's what you would want the suppository to do, but um, you know, like I said, I'm I'm not a big fan of of using suppositories in general, at least for moderate and severe dysplasia. I would consider using suppositories in a couple different circumstances. One is if you only have HPV, you don't have dysplasia, why not try them? There's no harm. You could use vaginal suppositories, make some dietary changes, do some supplementation, and um, you know, and 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 see what the outcome is. Also, if you have mild dysplasia and you either don't want to do escharotics or you can't do escharotics, then likewise, I would consider doing um, a conservative approach. Maybe doing the suppositories again, diet therapy, supplement um, changes, and again, see if it um, doesn't go away. 
I've always been a proponent of doing escharotic treatment for any level of dysplasia, just because we don't know who's going to have a problem with it and whether it's going to progress or not. The problem with not effectively clearing mild dysplasia is as soon as it becomes moderate, your doctor is going to be wanting to do surgery and pressuring you to do surgery. So it gets a little bit more scary as you get moderate and severe dysplasia, and it makes it more likely that under pressure you might make a bad decision regarding your treatment. Where you could also possibly do um, suppositories is with moderate dysplasia. With moderate dysplasia, it's not yet severe, so you probably have a little bit of time. If you can't do escharotic treatment, like you're somewhere in our country, somewhere where it's not available and you find that you can't do it or you can't afford it, you can't travel, whatever the case may be, can't find a practitioner, um, then you could try suppositories. I'm not advising to do that necessarily. Um, it's just that you do have a little bit of time and um, you could treat it conservatively and do the suppositories and diet and supplement and see what happens. With severe dysplasia, I would not recommend at all using uh, vaginal suppositories as the mainstay of your treatment. The problem with CIN3 is that, you know, in the whole continuum of dysplastic change, the next step is um, cervical cancer. So it's, there's a lot more risk involved with treating CIN3 like that in the event that it doesn't work. Um, you could have um, something, you know, put far worse than, than the dysplasia. With CIN3 or severe dysplasia, you really have two options to treat. You could either do a LEAP or do escharotic treatment. I would not use suppositories. I hope you found this video useful. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below or contact me directly. And uh, please subscribe to my channel if you'd like some more information relating to HPV and dysplasia.